Welcome to the Love of the Star podcast. I'm Bobby Belt, Dallas Cowboys insider for 105.3 The Fan in Dallas. Joined, as always, by Brian Broaddus, former Super Bowl winning NFL scout. He is now the co-host of the G-Bag Nation, 2 to 7 p.m. Central, Monday through Friday on 105.3 The Fan in Dallas. He is also the pre- and post-game co-host on the Dallas Cowboys radio network. Brian Broaddus, how you doing? I'm doing well, and that's uh, Bobby Belt, who is uh, Dallas Cowboys <laughs> Uh, insider for 105.3 The Fan. He also has a show in the morning, uh, Sean and RJ and Bobby, 5.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. So make sure you yes. check that out too, please. Oh, thank you. I I, I always appreciate it. We, we need to catch up to you guys on G-Bag in, in the ratings. So, you know, yeah. but it, just, it happens that way, Brian. Uh, all right, Brian. So uh, next segment, I know the, the news, Bobby Wagner getting released in uh, Los Angeles. A lot of people have questions about that. We'll talk about Bobby Wagner a little bit next segment uh, and maybe the linebackers in general. But, you know, knowing that the Cowboys may not want to pay what Bobby Wagner wants, Bobby Wagner may want more than, you know, the Cowboys or us as analysts or fans think is reasonable. Uh, But I've got a a little bit of a a breakdown of how I think it would make some sense to do it. Uh, And so we'll talk about that next segment. First, I want to lead off, though, Brian, uh, there's an article from, do you know a gentleman by the name of Todd Archer? Do you know that guy? Familiar with his work. He's uh, he's pretty good at what he does. Uh, I'd, say he's, I'd say he's real good at what he does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's, he's not bad at it. He, he's a, he is, the uh, of course, the Cowboys reporter for ESPN, and he is on top of it on this beat. If, if you ask me, who are, if, if somebody were to ask me, who are the two people I should trust most on this beat in terms of when they report something? Todd Archer, Michael Gelkin. Those are the those are the guys. Now, if I report something, you can trust I I verified it, but the guys who are most consistently going to break something or give you a heads up, Archer and uh, Gelkin, those are the guys who are on top of it. Uh, and Todd wrote this article that I thought was a, a good idea, so I wanted to touch on it here in this first segment. It is, the title is, With 19 Free Agents, Who Should the Cowboys Pay This Offseason? Which, okay, that's not unusual. A lot of people tackle the question of the free agents and who should they should pay, but I thought it was interesting that Todd broke it down into tiers where, hey, these are the points where you should walk away from each of them once it gets to this point. So almost like a guide of as long as they fall into this range, sure, re-sign them. And so I want to go through these uh, the, these different categories he has. He has stretch the budget to keep, don't overpay, take a chance, pay market price, either or. And move on. So we'll try to move through these as as fast as we can here. First one, Brian, stretch the budget to keep. He's got two names on here. He's got first one, safety, Donovan Wilson. He says the Cowboys-based defense essentially features three safeties. Says that Wilson is a tone setter on defense that led the league in takeaways each of the past two seasons. He's the type of player the Cowboys want. Drafted in the sixth round, developed into a starter. And then the other one is linebacker Leighton Vander Esch. When he was lost to a trap strain late in the season, his absence was felt. He was their best tackler. He's good in coverage. He gets everybody lined up correctly. Brian, would you agree with Todd Archer that if you're going to stretch the budget, if you say, hey, this is what we have in mind, and they come back and say, well, this is what we have in mind, then those are two players that you say, all right, well, we we got to come closer to their direction because we can't afford to lose these guys. Yeah, I absolutely do agree with Todd. And I know you and I do a lot of work on the draft show, and I, I think we're going to get into several safeties uh, that whether they're free safeties, strong safeties, uh, you know, could be in the mix for the Cowboys uh, this spring when we get to the draft. I think Donovan Wilson does a lot of things for you, though. I, I think that is an absolute stretch the budget guy. Leighton Vanderish is a very interesting one because when you watch the defense and how uh, they play, his ability to line people up, his ability to make plays, his ability to uh, read, react, diagnose the play, make a tackle, I, I think that was clearly evident as well. I, I think that Leighton Vanderish and Donovan Wilson both clearly deserve your attention as far as trying to re-sign. Is there anybody else that, and we'll, we'll go through the names and see what you think of them, but is there anybody else that's on their free agent list that stands out to you as, hey, I would also add this guy to stretching the budget? Well, I kind of feel like you need to think about what's going on at left guard, uh, you know, with uh, with Connor McGovern there. But, uh, but that is another position that, again, as you and I work through this draft, uh, there's tackles trying to play guard. There's a potential center that could play guard maybe. Uh, it's a little bit more of a position for the draft that's in flux. So I would think that maybe Connor McGovern would be a guy that I would kind of 
put maybe on the fringe of what we're about to talk about. The next uh, topic that, uh, or the next section that Todd has here is don't overpay. So the, this to me would be guys that are, uh, and he doesn't define each one, but this to me sounds like the guys that, yeah, pay, a, you, you know, bring them back, but it's on your terms. If they want to come back on your terms, great. If they want, you know, more than, than that, then you need to just say goodbye to them. And here are the three names that he has here, and I'll, I'll read them off, and then we'll go into them a little bit. First one, wide receiver Noah Brown. Uh, he was asked to play a larger role than anticipated, and he mostly responded while continuing to be a core special teamer. Uh, defensive end, Dante Fowler Jr. He says it's hard to argue with six sacks and 343 snaps in 2022. Um, says if they lose him, they'll have to find a, co a comparable talent to replace him. And then the third one, cornerback C.J. Goodwin, calling him the Cowboys' best special teamer. So, Brian, are those all three guys for you that you say – Sure. If they want to come back on a, a deal that, that makes sense for us, then have them on back. But if they want more than that, we need to say goodbye. Or are those guys that you would just flat out say goodbye to? I think I would say goodbye to all those guys myself. I, I understand what Fowler did in, in the six sacks. And you know what? He, he you know, he 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 got himself back in good, uh, good, uh, good shape with people evaluating tape. Uh, you mentioned all the snaps. You mentioned the sacks. I feel like I could do better. I feel like I could, you know, uh, I could maybe find somebody else uh, to fill that role. My expectations for him weren't very huge to begin with, but to his credit, he did a nice job. But I feel like I can move on from there. Uh, Noah Brown is another guy that, you know, Noah Brown's always going to be the guy that's kind of like gum on your shoe. Uh, he's, <laughs> it, it's always going to be on there. It's hard to get off. Uh, you know, Noah Brown's one of these guys that does a, a really nice job for you, but I don't think anybody else around the league really respects what Noah Brown does. And so I think you'll probably get him back on your terms, but I would probably move away uh, from that right there myself. I see. I agree. I think that you can find somebody to do what Noah Brown does for a uh, cheaper than what Noah Brown will do it for. Right. Uh, and, and I mean, Noah Brown is good and I understand it doesn't cost a lot of money. Noah Brown contributed at a certain level. He helped you. You won the Cincinnati game because of him. Uh, Noah Brown is not a player that says to me, Oh yeah, that's a guy we should give a fourth contract to. He's had three contracts here. This would be contract number four yeah. for Brown. And it just it does not feel to me like a guy that, that you would fight for. I would be okay with Fowler back if he if he played really cheaply. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that one. CJ Goodwin, I I need I need somebody who's got got a real chance to play. I understand you got your special teamers and everything like that. I need somebody who's got a chance to actually contribute in the secondary. Well, this is where uh, if Kelvin Joseph and we've learned about Kelvin Joseph and there's times where he's been a really good special teams player. Yeah. But if Kelvin Joseph doesn't develop into the corner that they thought he might, maybe this is where he takes over the CJ Goodwin role and then you can use him as an emergency in case something happens in a game. I mean, they think really highly on special teams of Kelvin Joseph and Nashawn Wright. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, all right, well, then keep those two guys since you're probably going to try and get them some work at corner anyway give me guys who can do both. I don't want a guy just languishing on the back end of the roster is just, well, that's our special teams guy. I, I think you have a couple of decent special teamers. So I would say goodbye to, to Goodwin and Brown, I think, and then go ahead. And if, if Fowler came back on a, a decent deal, I'd do that. The next crop is take a chance, which is a, is a little undefined. I, I, I would say that I think this means go ahead and bring them back recognizing risk, recognizing risk for them and recognizing risk for you. And uh, so here are the three names that Todd came up with running back, Tony Pollard. Well, I think, well, well, let me think this. I, I think this is like, take a chance that let them go out and, and look at free agency and take a chance that they could end up back with you. That's kind of what I, I kind of envisioned this. That, thing. that could be, that could be it. Although he includes Pollard here as a franchise tag guy who would not go out to free agency at that point. Okay, so I think, then, yeah, but see, that's what I'm saying. In my mind, for you, yeah, yeah, yeah. For I me, for me, I wouldn't tag Pollard just because of what I know about uh, free agent running backs uh, right now and what I know about the draft. Uh, you know, I, I think in talking to some people around the league about Tony Pollard, it's really 50 50 on him, whether they would, there, you know, I, I believe there's people say, yeah, for one year, go ahead and do it and see where you're at. But I also feel like he's coming off an injury. There's a crop of running backs that are on the street and ones that are also in college that are pretty significant. I'm going to take a chance. I could get it back on a one-year deal, not for $10 million. 
Here are the guys that Todd had. uh, Tony Pollard, franchise tag, looms for Pollard. That would make sense for the Cowboys if they don't have a long-term deal in place by March 7th. That's interesting. That sounds almost like there's – if Todd's saying that, that makes me think the Cowboys would at least be open to a long-term deal potentially. Uh, The other name, cornerback Anthony Brown. Cowboys never really replaced him after he suffered a torn left Achilles in early December. Signing back on a one-year deal makes the most sense for both sides. And then defensive tackle Jonathan Hankins picked up in a trade with the Raiders. Hankins was able to anchor the middle, although a biceps injury cost him the final month of the regular season. Turns 31 in March, but would it be better to have somebody like him than a younger player who will have to figure out the NFL game? At this point, take a chance on Hankins. Brian, I don't know about you. I I, I know what you feel about Pollard. I would probably tag Pollard just for a get-me-over year and then let him go. Um, and I would I would be willing to bring back Jonathan Hankins. I have uh, really no interest in a 31-year-old cornerback who just tore his Achilles, though, coming back. None at all. I really don't either, Bobby. And I think, again, this is a draft that has a pretty deep group of corners. This is actually a draft that has uh, several of those big trash cans full of dirt that are 338 pounds that play in the middle. Todd's right to talk about the young guy trying to develop because we've been waiting for Quentin Bohanna to do the same darn thing. And it just hasn't happened there. So, uh, I can understand bringing back Hankins. I'm going to let Brown walk, and I'm going to I'm going to take a chance on Tony Pollard that he can't get the deal that he wants. Next grouping of players pay market price. So to me, this sounds like whatever the market determines these guys are worth, you should match it. Uh, and so those guys that uh, Todd Archer has are quarterback Cooper Rush, saved the Cowboys season after Prescott's thumb injury. Defensive tackle Carlos Watkins, an underrated part of the defensive front. Left guard Connor McGovern started 15 games, was solid, nothing spectacular, but solid. And linebacker Luke Gifford, who uh, Coach McCarthy said late in the season, felt like Gifford could be a regular on defense if needed. Uh, Brian, those four, do you agree those are guys that whatever the market determines they're worth, go ahead and pay it? Yeah, I I brought up uh, Connor McGovern early about that, depending on what you do at the left guard spot. You know, um, that's that's a position that they're clearly going to have to to figure out. I kind of feel like with Cooper Rush that, you know, it's you might be in a little bit of a bidding war there. I'll be real interested to see what happens uh, with the Los Angeles Chargers now that uh, Kellen Moore is the offensive coordinator. Does Cooper Rush get a little bit better of a contract than what you're willing to offer him? So, uh, but Todd's absolutely right. Cooper Rush, you know, four out of five games, he clearly did his job and that's worthy, but how much is worthy, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll see about that. But I, I kind of I kind of have my plan about these guys. I think Todd's on the right path. I would be fine letting Cooper Rush go. I like I mean, I, I understand what he did. It was an admirable job. Uh, I, I don't want to pay premium backup quarterback money, which I think Cooper Rush could get. And if you're going to let the market dictate it, I don't know that I want to pay that. I, I like Carlos Watkins. I'm completely Watkins, fine. Yeah, Watkins. I, yeah, you absolutely. W- Watkins is a is a perfectly acceptable rotational defensive lineman who gives you some flexibility. No problem with that one. McGovern, again, no problem with it. I don't think you need five studs on the offensive line. I think if you feel good about your tackles, you've got McGovern or you've got Zach Martin, you've got Tyler Biotish who's improving. I think you can be just solid there. And if that's all Connor McGovern is, I don't think that kills you, and and that's perfectly acceptable, I think, to bring him back. Uh, Gifford, they need linebackers. Uh, they, they they need to make sure that they have their, their linebacker crew in general. It should not kill you as bad as it did when Leighton Van Der Esch went out of the lineup. Uh, and so if they think Gifford can be part of that, okay. He is a really good special teamer. Again, that keeps a lot of guys around. Um, but Gifford is, is, to me, take him or leave him. I, I, I think it's more of a leave him situation there. I'm, you know, I'm, if, you know, you're and again, I, I sounds really harsh to say, but there were opportunities he had to play linebacker and he was just okay. You know, there was nothing really flashy or anything about that. So if I'm going to rely on you to come in and give me something as a linebacker, much like my, Mike McCarthy said, uh, then you have to prove that. And I, I personally did not see that. Next one, next section, either or. So these are kind of take them or leave them guys like I just referred to Luke Gifford as. Uh, He's got the two long snappers here, Matt Overton and Jake McQuaid. Uh, The offensive tackle, Jason Peters, and wide receiver, T.Y. Hilton. I think this is the perfect spot for all four of those guys that you can either take them or leave them. If Peters wants to come back and and contribute and 
and things like that, that's fine with me. Um, Hilton, maybe. Uh, and then, yeah, just pick your long snapper. But, yeah, I think on all these, I'm kind of – I'm good either way. I'm bringing back McQuaid. You clearly had some problems with – they started missing – uh, those field goals and extra points and things like that, where the snaps were getting smothered on the ground, having, you know, that wasn't exactly perfect. Uh, you had, I believe, a block or something. What was the one where you had the off snap? I'm trying to remember the game on a punt. that ended Oh, up, yeah, it was Washington, wasn't it? Yeah, it, the ball was to the right, and it ended up, you know, a bad situation. And so I, I'm bringing back McQuaid because I didn't see those problems, but everybody else I could probably move on from. All right, and then the final group here is uh, the move on. So this one is just doesn't matter the value. D don't even worry about it. Just go ahead and move on. He's got three players here, linebacker Anthony Barr, yeah. tight end Dalton Schultz, and kicker Brett Maher. If you could get – I, I would, again, not be opposed. I, I like Schultz. I think he serves a purpose in this offense. If, if it made sense, like money-wise, I'd be fine with him coming back. Barr was way too inconsistent for me. That's fine to let him go. And I understand how it ended and everybody got upset about it. I don't trust that you're just going to go out there and find a better kicker than Brett Maher was for you last season. So yeah, I, I get I get why Schultz is out. I would like to try and keep him. But the one that I just – I don't totally understand and I don't know why we're just writing it off is Brett Maher. Well, yeah, especially when last year they, you know, they were talking about, you know, Garibay and then uh, Hirelahu. They were talking about all those guys and they were really happy and then – all of a sudden we got to Oxnard and those guys couldn't hit the broad side of a barn to say. And so I uh, feel like that you could bring Brett Maher back. Just make sure you have some competition for him, you know, whoever that is. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. The Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can find it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, uh, some of the news out there as, as we're starting to get some of these names trickling out of guys that are going to be released or uh, who have been released – uh, one of the names that stands out here uh, to a lot of Cowboys fans is Bobby Wagner. Uh, the Rams are going to go ahead and move on from Wagner, who is almost 33 years old. A lot of people thought he was past his prime. He played fantastic this year for the Rams. He was one of their few bright spots, still playing at a very high level, uh, showed it as a blitzer, showed it in coverage, uh, run defense. We already know he likes Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn likes him. They've got a relationship. Um, he's a player who he talked about after he went to the Rams, gave interviews and said, oh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to go to Dallas. That's where I, I, I wanted to go. So we know that was where he preferred to go. Uh, but, Brian, when you you look at the prospects of Bobby Wagner being a free agent again, and I'm going to lay it out here in a sec how I think the money could work if they were willing, uh, would you take a chance on Bobby Wagner here in Dallas? Yeah, the question you have to ask yourself, is it Bobby Wagner or Leighton Van Der Esch? That's the question you really have to ask yourself. Which one would you like to have? I know for a fact, uh, talking to my gang of seven, I had three guys get back to me and to a man, they were adamant that Bobby Wagner can still play and play at a high level. Uh, I talked to some people around the league also about that might know what the Cowboys situation was when it came to the contract. And they really, really weren't close. You know, Bobby Wagner wanted to be here, but they really, really weren't close. And, you know, his value and potentially what the Cowboys has the value uh, wasn't close. So I kind of felt like that maybe some groundwork had been laid there, much like with what we're talking about with uh, with Odell Beckham, that you've mm -hmm. kind of gone through the process of courting and you've kind of figured out numbers and where it needs to be. Uh, this is going to be about, yeah, if Bobby Wagner wants to play for the Cowboys, this is going to fall under the – it has to be for the right price situation. But I, I mean, as much as we talked about Leighton Vanderish being back and we were, you and I both were uh, on board with that, having Bobby Wagner or having Leighton Vanderish to me would be a pretty good, pretty good get if you ask. Now, my question here is, is that, you know, you, you heard they didn't, they really weren't anywhere close on a deal. Do you think the way that Bobby Wagner played last year and showed what he still had? do you think they would have been more willing to make that deal last year if they knew where he was at? I think probably Dan Quinn probably told them this guy could still play at a high level, you know, and Will McClay is a defensive coach by trade. So he probably evaluated Bobby Wagner himself. I'm sure that Dan and others were saying positive things about him. 
You know, they just looked at their situation and said, hey, we can't, you know, we can't do this. We've got young guys we need to look at. We've got Leighton Vander Esch. We've got Barr. We've got, you know, they probably saw a lot of, a lot of, a lot of guys in the, in the room. And that probably deterred them from going after Bobby Wagner. But if Dan Quinn was the one standing up on the table for Bobby Wagner and he played the way he did, I think they need to listen to Dan Quinn next time he brings up a player. So here's my my suggestion here for you, Brian. What if I told you that you can get Bobby Wagner here? You're, you're going to have to commit to him for two years, but you get Bobby Wagner here and you do so without ever having him cost in those two years more than six million dollars on the cap are you interested always so bobby wagner's deal that he signed in los angeles was for five years and 50 million dollars uh mm -hmm. so five years 50 million is what he signed he ends up getting uh after bonuses and some other things i think he got a little over 10 million of it uh is what he ended up making on the deal uh, so what was left on the deal, the, the thought was that Bobby Wagner, would there wouldn't be an out on the contract really until after the third year. These next two years, he was due to make $18.5 million. So if the Cowboys approach Bobby Wagner and say, Bobby, look, essentially we want to sign you on a two-year $20 million deal, fully guaranteed. We are going to give you all that money that you thought you were getting with the Rams these last two seasons. We're going to match it. In fact, we're going to go a little bit above it. Two years, $20 million. And if he's interested in that and says, yeah, okay, then it's the same discussion they've had with several other players before, which is, okay, in order to do this, got to tack on some void years or some empty years where it, it needs to be able to make sense for us. So if you make him that promise and tell him you'll give him two years, $20 million, here's what you could do. You sign him for four years, $40 million, Brian, okay? Yeah. That is guaranteed. That's the first two years, the $20 million. Give him a $16 million signing bonus. So the way that the cap hits work, I'll try to explain this as best I can for people who aren't familiar with it. The cap hit is your salary plus whatever prorated signing bonus you have. So when you get a signing bonus, in this instance, if he got $16 million over four years, the NFL would say, okay, well, so you don't have to eat that charge all in one year. We're going to spread it out evenly over the life of the contract, up to five years. So that would be... Four years, you divide 16 by four. All right, you're going to have to take a $4 million cap hit on each year. Okay, no problem. So the $16 million signing bonus is 16 of the $20 million you've guaranteed him. You give him $2 million in 2023. You give him $2 million for a salary in 2024. His salary plus the prorated signing bonus comes out to $6 million for a cap hit in both years. Then 2025, his salary jumps to $10 million a year, which is the average of the contract. And at that point, if you were to release him after the second year, uh, you end out obviously taking on some dead money because the prorated cap hit accelerates. But you release him and you free up $6 million on the cap in 2025. So I tell you, you can have a cap hit in 23 and 24 of $6 million, And then in 2025, you can free up $6 million by dropping him. Does that interest you from a financial standpoint? Yeah, you sound like you've talked to his agent about this already. <laughs> he doesn't have an agent. He represents himself. So uh, I, th I think I think you've got, uh, you know, I, I think that's a very well thought out um, uh, way of operating. Uh, I kind of wish that the Cowboys would have figured something out for him last year, to be honest with you. I mean, that would have been nice to have him. Uh, you know, the defense probably would have been even better. But, yeah, I, I think that I think that your logic, uh, the 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 salary, the the bonuses, the cap hits, all those things are very well thought out there. Now, the only problem there, and, and tell me if you think this would give them any pause or if it would give you pause if you were you, – you did pro scouting. You you stood on the table for Leroy Glover coming to Dallas. Um, so would it give you any pause that he is entering his age 33 season and I don't have a good way to get out of this contract for two years? I would have to commit to we're locked in for two years. No no getting out of it early. Would I that just, give yeah. pause? Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. This guy, there's uh... – this guy's got that football gene in his body where I feel like that if you had him for two years, you're going to get the absolute best out of him. You you look at the games played. This guy doesn't miss games. He just doesn't. I mean, it's a he's got that warrior mentality. He he loves football. He loves the opportunity to play football. I don't think you have to worry about guys like this at all. I really, really don't. 
Then the other question would be, because under this assumption where I'm, I'm stacking up a contract like this, you're approaching Bobby Wagner from the idea of, hey, you thought you were going to get these next two years before you were going to be a cap casualty. We'll match it. In fact, we'll go a little bit above. Does a 33-year-old linebacker, no matter how well he played, does his level of play, the fact that he showed what he can still do, does that drive up his price any, or does it balance by saying, yes, you showed what you can still do, and that's why you're not getting paid less than you were going to get in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. You're still a 33-year-old linebacker. Yeah, I think you I think you've got the I think you've got the contract structured right. I'm not going any more for a 33-year-old linebacker, but I'm not taking you down to veteran minimum either. You know, I'm making sure that you're that you're where you need to be paid. Now, you said you think you got to pick one or the other. Is there if Leighton Vander Esch is willing to come back on one year five million? Is that is that an investment? Like if we if we were to take this Bobby Wagner contract, let's say it played out this way, you'd have to give one year five million fully guaranteed to uh, you know uh, Leighton Vander Esch. Would that be acceptable to you? Do you say that's too much? Eleven million dollars. I don't necessarily want to commit that to two linebackers that have their issues. What would what would you would you be open to that? Man, I I think I would take Bobby Wagner over Leighton Vander Esch. I just think I would. I don't feel like that I, like I said, Leighton Vander Esch. I mean, my man, he plays at a very very high level, but there's always going to be those couple of games where we're probably not going to have him, you know. And I that kind of worries me. And we've seen it. He has a history of the stingers and the neck thing, but he plays. He comes back and he plays and he plays and he plays and he plays at a high level. I just feel like though with Bobby Wagner, I got a difference maker. And not that man, it sounds terrible to say that because I think Leighton Vanderish can be a difference maker, but not to the level what Bobby Wagner is. If he gave me a choice between one or the other, I'm taking Bobby Wagner over Leighton Vanderish. But does it have to be one or the other? Would you be open to have if it's just a one year deal, would you be open to to have oh, absolutely both? absolutely I, I think absolutely. I think that makes your linebacker core really, really strong. Absolutely, there. absolutely. Yes. If it, but I, I in my mind, I'm kind of thinking I can have one or the other. But if you tell me that Leighton Vanderish has no other interest around the league and he would come back for a one year deal again, I, I have no problem with that. Is it they, they clearly have fallen in love, or Jerry Jones has fallen in love with the just the idea of Odell Beckham Jr. as a cowboy. Odell yeah. Beckham Jr. obviously has a lot of questions. People don't know exactly where he is at as is at as a player. If you were in that personnel department, would you be arguing for it? Look, I, I understand we like Odell Beckham Jr., but before jumping into this, why are we not using these funds on a position that we need help at where we feel much better about what that guy can do now? Yeah, I, I think the thing with Beckham – What's interesting, Bobby, and I know you're getting into it like I have with the draft. Mm -hmm. I just I just don't feel like, and I keep using the draft as a reference point because I think that's what the Cowboys front office wants to do. They yeah. want to draft. They love drafting. They love trying to find players. And they do it a good, uh, they do a pretty good job of it. Um, I do not see the level of wide receiver that I've seen from the past three classes of wide receivers in the NFL draft. I don't see that. I mean, I think that you're taking a really a big risk at 26 if that receiver is there. Uh, and I kind of have that feeling that, you know, maybe if we get down the second, third round, that maybe it'll, you know, maybe you'll find the right guy. But at 26, I don't see that right guy. And now I would, I'd like to say, you know, if one of those guys were to fall, if one of those guys were to fall to you and, you know, when I'm talking about, uh, you know, the USC kid and, and, you know, Hyatt from Tennessee and, you know, yep. I, I just kind of feel like though, those, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, Johnston from TCU, if they were, you know, if they were to get to you at 26, I'd feel a lot better about that. We'll see with Smith and Jigba and the others that are behind because the first four linebackers, or first four receivers go off the board now at 26 that's not I'm, I'm starting to look at the best tight end in the draft I'm starting to look at maybe the best guard in the draft I'm starting to look at the best corner in the draft and I'm starting to look at other positions is what I'm doing so my point is though if you want to go out and spend money on Odell Beckham maybe that makes some sense or if you want to turn around and move that 26th pick for For a guy there in, uh, in Arizona, uh, a guy in Buffalo that comes available, 
I think you have to be open to those kinds of thoughts. You are listening to the Love of the Star podcast. Love of the Star is an Odyssey podcast. You can listen to it on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Brian, it is now time for our Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag, which I'm, I'm going to have to ask the first question here uh, from Jeff Paddock because uh, he literally wrote me an email uh, to the Dean Julia Love of the Star mailbag, as you can see there on, there on the screen. Uh, so he says, uh, Brian, what would be your favorite two realistic Cowboys free agents? And then pretending they are signed, how would you structure the draft based solely on need? So I, I get the the sense that Brian, your favorite free agent might be Bobby Wagner, just from yes. what he essentially yeah. do. Yeah. And then is the other one, uh, I don't know, would you would you look at a maybe a Robert Woods? Yeah, I think the thing with Robert Woods is is really, really interesting because there's another guy that that can still play and still play at a high level. I think you're going to have some competition with him again. We'll see what the Rams do. Maybe even the team that drafted him, the Bills, would be. But I, you know, I I think that you know, and and, and again, talking to like my. You know, seven guys when when you've been Woods name, you know, they're they're very much that, you know, he could be that guy that is like a possession, like a third. His production, they'll say, was a little skewed by the bad, inconsistent quarterback play, but the guy's really smart. He knows how to get over. But you can take the physical on him and see where he's at for sure. But I can about going out and getting a uh, going out and getting a wide receiver that can make some plays. All right, next question here from Xavier Gonzalez. Uh, is Keely Ringo, Georgia corner, is he a legitimate option at pick 26? Before before we get into that answer, uh, you, or, or before I, I let Brian give you his thoughts on the player, um, we will all have a better idea here over the next month or so what it is that the Cowboys yeah. think of guys like that. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll be able to tell you with more authority maybe what the Cowboys think of him here in a couple weeks, but just for now, I just want to give a heads up that when we're talking about is he a legitimate option, this is more just going to be us weighing in on this and our opinions uh, until we we start to hear a little bit more buzz around what the organization thinks about him specifically. But uh, Brian, a, a very, you know, a flawed but, uh, you know, impressive traits corner there in Keeley Ringo. Yeah, he's got the size, and you mentioned the traits and all that stuff. If you, on my board as I sit here and look at it, Porter from Penn State, Gonzalez from Oregon, Witherspoon from Illinois. Those are the three first-round corners that I have on my board. I have a feeling that all three of those guys will be gone. Now we talk about back from Maryland. I have him over Ringo myself. And then Forbes uh, from uh, from Mississippi State and then Cam Smith from South Carolina. That's kind of my second round of guys. But I'll tell you what, man, there's a lot to like about Ringo, and I have a feeling he's going to test really, really well at the Combine. The size is going to be impressive. Impressive, Excuse me. The movement's going to be impressive. Um, I'll be interesting to see, though, at 26, if he is on their board higher than, say, what if a Nolan Smith's there as a defensive end? Uh, you know, what if uh, Torrance, uh, the guard from Florida, or uh, Michael Smith's from uh, – from uh, Minnesota. Minnesota, the center that you can maybe play as a guard, uh, right? The tackle from Tennessee is a, a really, really good prospect there. So, and maybe one of those tight ends, maybe Mayor from Notre Dame. I mean, I think that Ringo is going to have some serious competition at 26. I just don't know if it's going to come from the wide receiver group, but it could come from the tight ends, it could come from the offensive linemen, and it could probably even come from uh, the edge. Is, uh, is where we're looking at right now. Question here from at RD Bull one uh, Odell Beckham Jr. is still talked about like a certain ex-Seattle safety, cough, cough, Earl Thomas. Yeah. Is it even possible for him to come in here and it not be a complete circus? Probably not. Probably not. No, uh, he is always, um, he's always going to be that guy that is going to draw attention. Uh, you're always going to know where he stands emotionally. Uh, he's a guy that I mentioned loves to be coddled and loved. Uh, I know these things from being an LSU guy myself and knowing teams around the league that have had him in their building. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's it's never going to be easy. 
and but you're getting a tremendous player. Now, are you getting the player that was five to seven years ago? We'll see. But uh, right now, you know, wide receiver clearly is a, a need for the Cowboys in a way because you don't have a real clear picture of what uh, Michael Gallup is going to be. And I think Michael Gallup was dealing with a lot of things, not only physically, mentally, maybe off the field as well, that were causing him to – his attention to be diverted from being probably the best player that he could be. All right. And uh final question here from Casey Pringle. And I, I think this is an interesting point. Considering the fact this team has a draft and develop mindset, why do you think they're not more open-minded about trading players who are still in their prime for better draft capital? That's a really good question. Casey is Casey, right? Is what Casey the, Pringle. Casey, yeah. Casey, that's a really good question, Casey. Um, this is a team that I feel like in it and it's a fault to a certain extent when you when you really don't evaluate your team correctly and you fall in love with players that you should probably move on from and coaches get in that mindset and I think it's gotten better under the Dan Quinn administration when you look at guys like Jalen Smith and others that they've moved on from but it, you know, Randy Gregory, another one. Uh, but they clearly are more open to moving guys. Uh, they moved Cooper. The problem is everybody was getting first and second round players for their wide receivers, and you got a fifth. And I think everybody in the league that just kind of shows you that the Cowboys are like, listen, we're okay with trading players, but do they really know how to trade a player? You know, do they really know how to? maximize the absolute value out of the player to get, you know, some of these teams job, you know, uh, Philadelphia places like the other teams do a great job of manipulating the other around the league and convincing them. You've got to have our guy and you've got to give us a second round pick. You know, the Cowboys kind of like, okay, we want to move on from the guy, but, but where are they, where are they at in trading? That's where I, that's where I'm wondering, you know, that does it for us here today on the Love of the Star podcast. We'll be back with you guys with two new episodes next week, heading to Combine next week. Brian will be in Arizona. I will be heading to Indy at the end of the week for some Combine and hopefully some good nuggets for you guys from there. Until then, we will talk to you guys again next week. 